Hey everybody, welcome back to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. Today is October 6th, 2021. My name is Eric Herlock, and today I'm going to talk to Jeff Whaling from the National Hemp Association. We're going to hear about a lot of different things, uh, including the National Hemp Association's Standing Committee of State Hemp Organizations, uh, which is giving the hemp industry a greater voice in Washington, and how this group is trying to get an amendment into the infrastructure bill that could help fund the development of the supply chain. We're going to talk about a company called Black Buffalo, a 3D printing company that uses hemp in their slurry. We're also going to check in with the folks from Hempcrete Week to find out what's in store for this year's multi-day Hempcrete hands-on workshop. Today's show is brought to you by IND Hemp in Fort Benton, Montana. Be sure to check them out on their website, indhemp.com, and also go see their YouTube series called The Goodness of Hemp on YouTube. I'll have a link for all that stuff on the show page for this episode. All right, so so just one nugget of hemp news this week. Uh, This particular story comes from the argus.co.uk, but I've seen the story on other sites too. And it's about Paul McCartney. Sir Paul McCartney has revealed that he grows hemp at his farm, but fears his crops may be targeted by thieves. The Beatles star has started producing crops of hemp, rye, spelt, wheat, and pears at his home in Peamarsh near Rye. Speaking on the River Cafe Table 4 podcast, Sir Paul said he is following government regulations to grow hemp and hides his crop to stop them from being stolen by teenagers. He said, we're actually just getting into growing hemp. The funny thing with government regulations is you've got to keep it where people can't see it because you get all the kids coming in and robbing it. All right, Paul, that's fantastic. I am so happy to hear that you're growing some hemp on your farm and I would love to talk to you about it. So, Paul, send me an email. Send it to podcast at lancasterfarming.com. All right, let's get on with our show today. Coming up here is Jeff Whaling from the National Hemp Association. Jeff Whaling, welcome back to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you doing today? I am happy to be back with you, Eric, and we can talk about where we started and where we are today. Yeah, uh, let's just jump into it. So um, I got a press release from the National Hemp Association a couple weeks ago about an amendment to the infrastructure bill. Can you just tell us what's going on there? Yeah, as Eric, you will know, um, NHA created a standing committee of state uh, hemp organizations um, in response really to uh, a number of the hemp organizations that had no uh, voice in Washington and had been a state chapter of another hemp group. Um, So I think 10 or 12 of those organizations uh, formed a group and came to us and we created the National Hemp Association Standing Committee. Um, what uh, the it's a it's been a very good um, interaction working um, arrangement. Uh, those organizations are not sharing their dues with us. They raise their own money, keep their money at the state level, and the National Hemp Association supports them as much as we can on national uh, issues. Okay. Uh, this being one of them, certainly we all know that one of the biggest challenges for the hemp industry today is supply chain um, and investment. Um, you know, I certainly am across the country talking about, you know, this is not going to be a crop that will return to our landscape instantly just because of 2018 farm bill. And I, I'm surprised that I'm saying 2018 uh, when we're now starting to look at the 2022 right, farm bill. It's coming up. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there has to be a whole educational element. There has to be Um, some uh, infrastructure money put into it. And so when uh, we were provided with an opportunity to to start talking to the White House and USDA about areas of funding um, and then learn like so many people across the country that there was the infrastructure bill as well as the reconciliation 
uh, amendment that was moving forward, uh, our state hemp uh, organizations got together and they started to draft that language. Um, and when they all agreed of what that language was going to be, it was initiated by Jeff Green out of the Florida Hemp um, Council. And uh, we then, you know, put our, our signature to it and we did our work in reaching out to leadership uh, in Congress uh, while the other state organizations reached out to their local congressional members. Okay. And what kind of response are you getting from leadership? Uh, so, you know, I, I think this was a good learning curve for the state hemp organizations. Um, as I said, you know, alluded to earlier, I'm already in discussions and working with elected officials on the 22 farm bill. Uh, that's how far in advance. And although even today there is deliberations going on on both infrastructure and reconciliation, you know, we should have been in discussions with committee members months ago um, and trying to, you know, get at least hemp recognized. The response we've been getting from leadership at the House um, Ag Committee uh, and uh, from some of the Senate leaders is mixed. Um, obviously, their staffs are absolutely pushed to the limit trying to deal with the, the bigger trillion, multi-trillion dollar issues. And I know it sounds... Uh, ridiculous to say a billion dollars isn't a lot of money to be asking for, but in the big scheme of things, it's not. Um, and it takes as much work to move forward a piece on a billion dollars as it does you know, uh, a trillion. Um, so where are they going to put their efforts? So um, if anything, what this has done because of organizations uh, like yourselves and other media that is focused on this, it has raised the discussion about him. It's given us more exposure um, and certainly it's elevated the entire opportunity out there. So if we're not included now, um, I think that it's provided us with a foray to move this forward. Um, particularly, my hope is more the 2022 Farm Bill. Okay. I mean, because from inside the hemp space, we know that hemp could be a really effective tool in, you know, climate change mitigation, you know, like if on a big enough scale. Um, are the people in the new administration even thinking about that? Like, yeah, so the uh, reception that we have received from Secretary Vilsack um, and certainly from the Biden administration uh, has been um, surprisingly positive. Um, certainly, I started this process with Secretary Vilsack uh, back in 2013, 2014, um, and I've reminded him that uh, we started with him it grew under the Trump administration. Uh, we certainly would not want it to fail under him. Um, and, you know, I, I, I know that they really want to support the industry, but like many of the challenges that we are facing is that there's not enough research uh, understanding about the potential of hemp and how we get there. Uh, certainly you and I have walked this path. We live and breathe this subject matter. Uh, but we need to make sure that there is uh, that same sort of understanding of, uh, within government who make those decisions. So I'm pleased that Secretary Vilsack um, and USDA have now created a four-person um, internal working committee on hemp. Oh, okay. um, it's headed by the chief of staff um, under research. And when you think about that, um, the woman that heads up uh, this under research they are really looking at a strategy for hemp that is more focused on advancing that research that we need to get accomplished. Um, so working with them has been delightful. As you know, Eric, um, the, during the transition period, we had people from the White House come to us and ask uh, where might hemp fit into any of the 12 uh, priorities that they had identified for climate. Right. Uh, when we looked at those priorities, we, I, we thought that hemp could uh, participate in eight of those 12 issues as part of that solution. Those discussions continue. We know that the National Hemp Association's Climate Action Plan has been taken by the White House and distributed amongst some of the other agencies because we were asked by the chief of staff in DOE if we would find time to brief you know, his uh, biomass um, division and to talk about what the potential is there. So we know that there's interest. Obviously, we're not the number one priority. The administration's got lots of things on the plate right now. Um, but then um, under uh, 
the policy advisor on economic development in the White House, um, they're seeing this as a potential to help rural development and economic development. So they asked us and we uh, presented some three weeks ago now, um, a economic impact report uh, that also was accompanied by a document on how to build the sustainable hemp industry in America. And that has got um, really good response. And we have a follow-up meeting with the White House next week. Okay, great. Um, I saw you this summer out in Montana, out at the, uh, the IND Hemp Summit. Um, what did you think of that? What has come out of uh, that meeting for you and the National Hemp Association? Well, certainly, you know, the, the Elliott family who have put, I believe, some $25 million of their own money into this facility um, have been operating under the radar. Certainly, you know, when I created um, our collective growth SPAC, um, I knew that they were out there, and uh, but they weren't looking for money. So we really didn't have a lot of discussions with them. Wilson Kello, who is our researcher and head of marketing, um, had reached out to them to try and get an understanding of what they were doing. Uh, certainly, we know that they were uh, one of the groups that acquired some of the Sunstrand former equipment. Um, so we knew some of the background, but didn't know much about them. So when I was asked if I would come out to their summit, I jumped at the opportunity. And as you well know, absolutely um, salt of the earth, delightful people. Yeah. Um, they are all in, as Ken will say, and they are committed. They're doing it. Um, I, I just came back from uh, taking a group out to seeing them last week. Um, and the, the changes that I saw in the facility since we were all out there is amazing. They're just at that point where they're going to be turning on that system. And, you know, we went out to the fields that we also visited and saw them now uh, after they've been cut. Okay. They're reading in the field. Uh, so it was uh, delightful. But, you know, again, here is a group of business people with great success who have seen what you and I both know are the challenges for our industry, that we have this kind of fragmented national uh, uh, advocacy groups that all believe that we represent hemp on the national stage. Um, but it was the first time that someone brought us all together. And uh, I welcome that opportunity. Um, didn't mean that any of the challenges went away, but uh, certainly it provided an opportunity for uh, there to be an open dialogue and to see that, you know, we, we all have a very uh, uh, significant common interest in advancing the fiber and grain side of this industry. Right, right. Um, something that you brought up in that discussion that day in January was this, I this idea of an identity crisis, like maybe the hemp industry thinks it's much bigger than it actually is. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, until the cows come home. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, you know, I've certainly seen this uh, across the industry. Those of us who work on this every single day um, take pride in the work that we do. Um, and I know that many people, certainly Erica, our executive director and our Anna, uh, work every day to continue to educate people. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that you've experienced this as well. People haven't a clue. You know, there is um, a world of people who are inside the hemp space who right now, secretaries of ag and others, believe that hemp is only CBD. They don't know about the opportunities that I believe are much bigger from uh, fiber and grain. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there are... Uh, challenges where certainly the stigma that was attached to him um, still exists. And people are amazed when you get into a discussion about the potential of him. Um, certainly it's uh, uh, the opportunities that it brings for climate. Um, you know, it, it, people are flabbergasted and like, I haven't a clue. So yes, most of the people that are in our industry, because we happen to be at the epicenter of this, think that we are the, you know, the, the flavor of the month, the greatest um, opportunity that's come around. I believe that myself in my heart of hearts, but that doesn't mean that the people that we have to interact with, politicians and others, particularly people in Congress, who only have 15 minutes to listen to your story, um, are going to really capture the essence and the potential of what we're going to be. Uh, and what we can become. So I think if we continue our dialogue um, as we have our great partnership with New Holland Agriculture, as we continue to go to farm shows with them 
and talk to the farmers and listen to them and then try to bring about those solutions, uh, we are you know, slowly increasing the ring of uh, interest in education. But we will always have the same challenges um, unless we address them. Farmers want to know, how do I plant it? How do I harvest it? And where do I sell it? Right. And unless we address those things all at the same time, um, that interest will wane. And, you know, you and I will go the, the route of the, the dodo bird. Yeah, we're starting to see that at Lancaster Farming Newspaper. They've recently done a reader survey, and hemp is one of the least interesting topics to you know, this subsection of readers that actually take the time to fill out surveys. Yeah. And I, th and I think Eric, you, I hope you would agree that, you know, it is the CBD industry and listen, we have many members of the national hemp association who are in the CBD space. Um, we know how challenging it has been for them. Um, and we saw just this flood of people coming in. I refer to some of them as Beverly Hills farmers who came in with money and no experience whatsoever who were going to get into the space. I think that has harmed us because you know better than I that the word amongst farmers travels quickly. So the experience that most people have with CBD has become the experience of people in the hemp industry. Right. And of course, that's so far from the truth. Uh, but as we, you know, continue to forge ahead um, and large farmers are seeing the challenges with commodity prices, um, certainly, you know, I think one of the great stories that I bring back to Washington is one that I learned from Ken Elliott at, at IND Hemp, uh, where he was talking about one of the uh, gentlemen that has a 15,000 acre farm who is, uh, runs, uh, I uh, kind of a contracting harvesting service for farmers. Um, and that gentleman sat down and calculated what he and his family's take is from their 15,000 acres of planting. I think at this point it's wheat. Um, and at the end of the day, they make $14 an acre. And they're lucky that yeah. they have 15,000 acres. So there's some real cash there, but if that is the same across the country, you know, we know that farmers are looking for something new and interesting. And if we can deliver it to them, um, you know, it's going to come. Um, I spoke at um, the culmination of uh, UN conferences last week, uh, one that was focused on sustainability and the sustainable food chain. Um, and most people there uh, hadn't a clue about the potential of hemp. Um, and certainly as the UN uh, is really looking at adopting policies and encouraging uh, funding for agricultural initiatives that are also uh, going to help mitigate or address climate, you know, hemp, we all know, can be part of that solution. Um, despite the fact I've had those conversations for a long time, uh, you know, it gets lost in translation. Uh, so, you know, we have work to do, yeah, for no sure. doubt. Yeah. Um, so in the early days of this podcast, you were actually the very first interview I conducted. And then I published that interview on the second episode of the show. So, you know, this is a, uh, it's great to have you back on again, but you talked about you still get people coming back, Eric. Surprise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've uh, but done you a great job. Oh, thank you. Um, you talked about, you know, making Pennsylvania sort of an epicenter of hemp, you know, in, in the Northeast, you know, by bringing, um, you know, like manufacturing, like a, a hemp campus almost, right? And you're still, you still have plans for that and you're, you're moving closer to that from what I understand. Yeah. So, um, you know, Eric, as you uh, have learned through me, I, and I announced actually on, uh, at your kickoff from Penn State, mm -hmm. um, I just come from a meeting, uh, an open house with a division of the Hyundai industry uh, that's called Black Buffalo. It's a division of Big Sun Holdings, um, and uh, someone I've become quite close to, Michael Woods, who formerly managed the Rothschild family office, came from uh, Deutsche Bank, um, is now heading up uh, Big Sun Holdings on behalf of the grandson of the founder of Hyundai Industries. Um, and one of the things they're advancing here is 3D printing of houses um, uh, with concrete, and they are working to incorporate hemp into that. Um, I just came back from Montana last week, um, meetings with Michael Woods, um, because IND Hemp has got 10,000 acres of fiber that they're soon going to be um, 
trying to process and looking for end users. Sure. The real reason for us going out there is that IND Hemp is uh, looking to provide housing to their new employees. They're going to employ 77 to 100 people. And in a little town like Fort Benton, there just isn't that number of available houses for them to uh, occupy. So I brought both Black Buffalo um, and ourselves together with the Elliots um, because I thought that together we could solve two problems, not only looking at incorporating hemp into the slurry uh, that IND uh, can through the fiber that they can provide to Black Buffalo uh, for that slurry, but then we could also look at ways to do hemp flooring and hemp insulation and hemp creed and all those other things to really bring about a residential um, hemp based solution. Uh, meetings went really, really well. Um, in fact, today, Black Buffalo is out on their first uh, round of raising funds. I think they're going to be uh, oversubscribed. Uh, it's just amazing the technology uh, that they have. And imagine that they can build the vertical walls of a 1,500 square foot house in 24 hours. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, and it, you know, it, uh, it has such opportunities not only to address affordable housing, but can you imagine in areas that are devastated by storms and destruction, um, certainly they could move in and instantly uh, start to you know, provide these people with shelters. Sure. Uh, there is lots of, and, and what I am thrilled about, and Eric, I think that you know your audience, you and I need to remember that as we invest our time and energy, as I have done with Black Buffalo and Michael Woods and his team, what I found at the meetings that we had last week is that they have moved far beyond just talking about this. They are researching it. Um, they are investing their money and they want to come up with their own form of a hemp creek block, hmm. um, their own form of incorporating hemp fiber, maybe not a thick fiber, but more of a dust or a, a finely milled hemp uh, into that slurry. So those are the successes um, when people start to see a 3D printed house and, oh, by the way, it's made of hemp right. um, or in part of hemp, that's what's going to capture the imagination of the greater media. Yeah. Um, is there a Pennsylvania connection there too? Yeah, I knew you'd go back to that. So good <laughs> on you. Uh, good journalist. Um, there is. Um, I'm happy to report that uh, from that announcement that I made that Black Buffalo um, had uh, been looking at space in the Northeast, in East Stroudsburg. They have now closed on what was the former East Stroudsburg Pocono Airport. It's, a, I believe, a 100-plus acre wow. lot. Um, Black Buffalo will be putting their, uh, their manufacturing facility there, um, and they will also be doing some 3D-printed residential units on that property, uh, which will also become demo areas, and they have offered the National Hemp uh, Association's 501c3, which is the Hemp Innovation Foundation, um, uh, up to 30 acres on that site oh, wow. uh, for us to build a hemp research campus um, and to work out uh, whether or not they could 3D print the facilities that we need uh, right then and there. And certainly, uh, selfishly, we I could see us working on researching hemp um, as a construction material uh, right on that campus. Um, and, you know, it's in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, which is known as the Poconos, which is a tourist area. You know, there's lots of lakes and trees there. Um, uh, what I found to be absolutely delightful that within uh, three miles as the crow flies from that site, uh, there, there is thousands of acres of farmland along the Delaware Gap that right. is uh, operated by the federal government. Um, so we're going to start to sit down with those farmers and talk to them about adding a simple rotation of hemp into what they're already growing um, and, uh, you know, work out a program where they can figure out uh, how they can help us and we can help them. That's awesome. Uh, so, so that we're coming along nicely. Um, you know, this was a separate ask that we made of USDA uh, and the White House to help us fund that initiative. Uh, we haven't got a response on them, but we're proceeding no matter what. Cool. Um, with um, hemp in the slurry for 3D printing, um, is that does that compete with hempcrete, or is that a, a detriment to the the hempcrete industry, or is there room for everybody in here? 
there will there will continue to be room for everybody. And you know, I I have learned that you know, using the word hempcrete isn't um, you know the best thing to use. Um, I think as Cameron would say, you know, it's really hemp line. Hemp line. Okay. Um, and and certainly uh, there are so many different forms. So whether or not someone's going to put that into a block as as they've done with just biofiber in Calgary or like Cameron spray on mm-hmm. um, application. Um, and certainly people uh, putting it in between um, uh, boards and, and kind of doing a prefab uh, hemp house. Um, I think there is going to be room for all of them. Um, I think what, if you go to the Black Buffalo website and just look at how that 3D printer works, um, it actually prints the walls um, in two sections. So there's a there's an, an inner wall and an outer wall, and there's a six inch gap in between. Well, I would see that not only will we be able to put hemp into that slurry to print it um, to help that concrete stay rigid as it's starting to dry, uh, but we will also be able to, at the end of that pour um, or that print, to go back and fill that gap uh, with a hemp lime or a hemp crete, as you and I know it. Um, And then, of course, hemp flooring, hemp boards, hemp beams, all of that sort of stuff could come into play. Okay. Um, what's coming up for you? Do you have any, uh, interesting events in the next few weeks? Yeah, you know what? It's, uh, it's, it's busy, um, as usual. And, uh, I, I, I am, I'm thrilled at the invitations that I receive on a weekly basis from people. Um, I think Zoom has really benefited, um, me appearing at more places, um, but I'm missing the opportunity to do public events and right. to see people, um, and I'm happy that the Cannabis World Conference and Business Expo in Manhattan is returning to the Javits Center um, the first part of November, uh, 4th, 5th, and 6th. Um, okay. And certainly there's a big hemp focus on that. Um, the team at um, Christine Iannuzzi, who runs that show, um, has invited uh, me along with uh, Matt Anderson, who comes from the Vanguard Group, to co-host all three days um, of the conference um, discussions. Uh, And what we're going to do is kind of take a different kind of a television show format um, and just do a recap of uh, the discussions we've had and then focus on on the first day will be, you know, where we are. um, And all of our speakers will be talking about where we are Uh, the legislative process, where they are in their businesses. The next day we'll do a recap and then we'll talk about um, the challenges and barriers to building our industry. And then day three uh, will be successes and opportunities. Uh, We'll have investment panels for people who are out there doing it, uh, people that are raising money. And certainly we're going to start to bring corporate America uh, like Black Buffalo. Uh, Michael Woods is going to be there um, and members of his team to talk about what they are doing uh, ben Dobson, who is behind uh, Abby Rockefeller's uh, Hudson Carbon, is going to come and talk about how hemp can play a role in carbon credits. Yep, yep. Um, so, you know, there are opportunities of making additional money. You know, I've changed the way that I've talked about hemp, not as a dual crop, but as a triple opportunity crop. Uh, so that is, you know, seed, uh, fiber, and carbon oh, credits. Yep. Um, and And again, talk about you know, how do you get those carbon credits? What is the best way to ensure that that value is is going to be there and that there's a monitoring, there's a baseline? Um, you know, Ben is just a brilliant young man and, you know, he's got an awful lot to, to bring to this. And if there's going to be an appointee to uh, once the, uh, the Climate Solution Act is passed by the House, it's already been passed by the Senate, um, once USDA gets that and is going to set up a committee, my vote is for Ben Dobson to represent the hemp industry on that uh, panel discussion because he has an awful lot of hands-on experience, organic farming, and certainly understands carbon credits. Sure. Um, so all of that is going to be expanded on at CWCB Expo, and I invite people to uh, come out and you know let's uh, kind of interact. It is a full uh, vaccine and mask required event, um, but certainly it'll still allow us to interact with each other and talk about where we are and where we're going. Good, good. Yeah, I was at that expo in, I guess it was 2019 at the Javits Center. And 
I was expecting there to be lots of fiber and grain stuff there and it, it wasn't. So I was a little disappointed then. It was all like THC, CBD, but it sounds like uh, things have progressed a lot and there's going to be a, a more conversation about the, the grain and fiber side? It's certainly all of the focus um, on the three days there will be, you know, it is, it's a cannabis show. Okay. Um, so, you know, hemp and marijuana will be part of it. Certainly, you know, New York with the new governor, and I don't want to let out secrets about who may or may not be attending this event. Um, but I think that, uh, and, and their new Office of Cannabis Management legislation moving forward, their, you know, the new uh, chair person, um, their new executive director, they will all be people who have been invited to come and talk about their Office of Cannabis Management, which is, you know, a, a leading example of the potential of this one-stop shopping for the cannabis space, which includes adult use, medical marijuana, sure. uh, cannabinoids, and hemp. Um, and so that really is what CWCB Expo is going to focus on. Um, and I think that we're going to see more and more people talking about, you know, what is Delta 8, Delta 6 and Delta 10? And, you know, is that part of cannabis or hemp or, you know, how does it fit in? Right. USDA is going to be participating at the event. Oh, okay. Some of the members of, of the new internal working committee are going to be there. So I'm excited. I think it will be a refreshing way for us to gather once again and talk about it. Um, and there'll be an opportunity if people come to the conference, participate in a session, um, and then realize they have an awful lot more uh, questions to ask. What we've agreed is that uh, following each session, those individuals who are on the, the main stage are going to go into breakout rooms. So you'll have the opportunity okay. to have a more one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, so we're trying to make it really interactive and, you know, Eric, you and I have gone to a lot of these shows, and, and I'm certainly pleased that my friends at CWCB Expo, you know, take a lot of initiative to be first in the space. They have a lot of other shows that follow them. This is, again, going to be one of those great, um, you know, leads that they're going to take in providing a different format to have a discussion about our industry. Cool. I hope to get up there at least one of the days so maybe we'll see you there well there's going to be a virtual component to it as well eric oh, okay. so awesome well hey jeff it's great to talk to you today thank you for your time it's my pleasure as always eric and all the best all right so be sure to check out lancasterfarming.com uh, click on the links to go see the things that jeff was talking about uh, black buffalo and that video of the 3d printer is really just fascinating all right, so moving on, we're going to talk about Hempcrete Week with the guys who were bringing you Hempcrete Week. I went to this event last year up in East Stroudsburg, and uh, I was only there for a couple of days, but I learned a lot and met a lot of great people. And so I encourage you to check out this year's event, especially those of you in the trades, the builders, contractors, all that stuff. This is an amazing uh, development in construction. So anyway, here we go. Hempcrete Week. Eric Titus White, Cameron McIntosh, welcome back to the podcast. How are you guys doing today? Never better. Doing good, brother. Nice to see you, Mr. Herlock. Yeah, good to see you too. So uh, it's that time of year again. It's it's almost Hempcrete week. You know, it's exciting. Woo! Yeah, and so what? This is the second annual, third annual? How long have we been doing this? Second annual. Uh, it's a little bit later than it was last year, uh, but... Yeah, we're um, we're looking forward to doing this every year in you know September, October of every year. Cool. Well, tell me what's going on this year. Uh, this year we are kind of continuing on uh, last year's Hempcrete Week. Uh, we're going to be working more on the finishing side of things. Uh, so there's actually some uh, the Hempcrete that was sprayed here at the Hempstead. Uh, we will be finishing with plaster. So that's going to be exciting. Um, if anybody else uh, has a, a whole year to wait before they finish Hempcrete, like I do, um, let me know and we can include your building in the next year's Hempcrete week. But it's dry now. The stuff you did last year is finally dried, right? Well, well dry. Well, well <laughs> cured, yes. So what, it, what's special about this plaster? It's not just regular plaster. It's, it's what? Yeah, so this this is a technique uh, that I learned from a colleague of mine named Anthony Narone, uh, or better known as Duchamp uh, in Montreal. Uh, really, really uh, skilled plaster mason who also does hempcrete uh, up there. And 
I actually learned this uh, finish at the Cape Cod Hemp House uh, that was done uh, with our colleagues at Hempstone last, uh, what was that, May. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Michael, the owner, had hired uh, Anthony to come in and, and do this plaster finish. So it's basically, a, uh, it's a very limey hempcrete, essentially, that gets put on a bit like Adobe. Okay. Uh, very forgiving and easy for folks like myself who don't have the years of plastering experience that someone like Anthony would have uh, to get flat and, and looking nice. Now, what it is, again, is essentially a really limey hempcrete mix. So you can put it on pretty thick. Typically with plasters, we're doing, you know, quarter inch coats over okay. a period of time. Yeah. Uh, so this is going to add a little bit of another layer of, you know, insulation and good sound quality, but it'll allow us to make up some of the oddities in an older building like Eric's, mm -hmm. uh, where you just don't have, you know, plumb and true necessarily because the house was built, you know, hundreds of years ago um, and things have moved. So it allows us to build up uh, a nice flat layer quickly. Uh, that can then be uh, skim coated at, at a later date. Uh, but again, this is a, it's, it's sort of, you know, difficult to call it a plaster finish, although it's a, it's a finish for hempcrete uh, that works really well with the system. Uh, and again, it's, it's a healthy, you know, it's a very healthy material that adds uh, to the interior air quality uh, in, a, in, a, in a great many ways. So also okay. really, really exciting. Um, this is a one coat uh, plaster finish. Oh, nice. So okay. you are cutting down on all the time. It can be done. Yeah, yeah, it can be done as a one coat plaster finish, which Eric is uh, of the cloth, if you will, and, and is okay with seeing a little hemp herd in the wall. Okay. Um, whereas someone else might want it to look a bit more like drywall, at which point, again, right. you can skim coat it. But again, this is a really great finish to teach in a workshop because it's something that, again, you don't necessarily have to have a high degree of trowel skill to execute properly. So it's something that we wanted to show people again, a little bit of a sort of democratizing a, a plaster finish, uh, if you will. Cool. So that's October 17th. That's a Sunday that's up in Stroud, Stroudsburg. Is that where yep. the Hempstead is? Yep. East Stroudsburg at the East Hempstead. Stroudsburg. Okay. Um, uh, about an hour from New York city, an hour and a half from Philadelphia. All right, cool. And then, so Hempcrete week is actually three days this year. So that's Sunday. And then what's happening on Monday? Um, your birthday. Oh boy. Oh, that is my birthday. Oh, man. <laughs> We're going to have a trailer there that we can burn to help you with your healing from your, your <laughs> like an RV. Yeah. We're going to burn yeah, an burn effigy an of the RV. RV. <laughs> We're going to have to take an effigy. We're not an actual RV, but that would be bad for the environment. <laughs> the um, RV was bad for the environment. Let's yeah, be honest. It was bad for your environment. Too. Oh man. Uh, it's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm healing. It's, I'm healing up. It's all good, <laughs> but I appreciate that. Yeah. You're not shaking anymore. Um, so <laughs> What we're doing on Monday is a small retrofit of a building at our friend Ben Davies' farm, Wild Fox Provision. Wild Fox, yeah. yeah. Okay. Karen Bartow, yeah. Uh, so Ben and Kara uh, have been gracious enough to rent me a warehouse space after I got, uh, I lost my last space. So that's worked out really well. Pennsylvania hemp mines coming together in a, in a good location. So I'm renting a little warehouse there. And in the driveway, uh, is a small cottage, if you will, a very small cottage uh, that actually has something to do with uh, an old printing press that was in the area. The, the farmer that owned the farm that, that this thing's located at uh, actually did some printing down the road back in the day. So Ben, when he was stripping this place, found a bunch of litho plates oh, wow. um, of pictures of World War II veterans from the area that had been printed into a book and they were all in this thing. Oh, wow. Uh, in this little cottage. So it comes together really nicely. Ben's intention is to turn it into sort of a public library. Right. A free yeah. library. So we're going to, we're going to retrofit it with a little bit of hempcrete, do a, do a nice little plaster finish on it uh, and then set it up. So it'll be the Bartow public library and sort of harken back to its roots as a, as a print shop. Cool. And that's same kind of thing. People can sign up, they can get their, you know, hands in the, in the mix and, and try out doing some hempcrete. So we're actually going to yeah. spray that one. You're, so oh, okay. that's, that's going to be a demonstration of the e Reezy equipment, which is what uh, we've been using here over the last few months to execute all our projects with. Okay. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be hands-on. Yes. But it's uh, I, I would refer to it as a demonstration of the equipment. Um, and we're going to discuss that. Uh, and we'll end the day similarly to uh, Sunday at Eric's place with a little bit of dinner made by uh, Kara and Ben there. Okay. Uh, and maybe a campfire. So it'll be a, be a, be a nice day. Maybe that sounds good. Cake. Maybe a birthday cake maybe for a certain day. local journalist. Huh. Interesting. I'm intrigued. 
Uh, and then so that brings us to Tuesday the 19th. What's happening on Tuesday the 19th? Uh, Tuesday the 19th is uh, going to be at the Viaduct, uh, which is uh, owned by <clears throat> Antoinette uh, and Eric um, Oberholzer. Okay. Uh, this is a, it's an outdoor space underneath the bridge there in Philadelphia. And we are doing a hemcrete workshop as well. We'll be making some planter boxes, okay. uh, uh, potentially a feature wall. Um, but the, the exciting thing about Tuesday is uh, we're going to also open the end of the day up uh, to anyone that wants to uh, join us for uh, uh, basically a Hemp Creek Week uh, closing reception. Uh, also, Cameron's going to be doing an intro to Hemp Creek uh, building at this uh, location. Uh, we're really looking forward to getting everybody uh, from Philadelphia together. This is uh, really going to be one of the first times uh, because of the pandemic and everything mm -hmm. where we can have um, a, little, a little party, um, some good hemp-inspired food and drink. And uh, we'll get to listen to everybody, you know, talk hemp till we can't talk hemp no more. And so this is the All Together Now group, right? It is, yeah. So this is a, okay. an All Together Now uh, collaboration. And uh, Judy Wicks will also be speaking. Uh, we'll have uh, Cameron as the um, director of the, uh, bu you know, building, uh, Sustainable Building Coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, myself as the director of the um, Food Coalition for All Together Now. Uh, and, you know, the, just all the hamsters right <laughs> cool that sounds fun and um where can people go to sign up for for this fun so everything is posted um on my website uh the hempstead pa.com okay uh, it's a, an event bright link uh, you'll see it as soon as you go to the website um each day you can get tickets for each day you can also just get tickets for uh the reception and the intro to, to hempcrete um which is five to eight on tuesday uh, or you can get a ticket uh, with a little bit of a discount for the, you know, the entire week. Cool. Okay. Tell me again where in Philly it is. It's at the Viaduct. Viaduct. And Philadelphia. tell me where that is. Like, I don't know where that is. Um, well, it's under a bridge in Philadelphia. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, okay. And that's, um, that's about as much as we know. Five, 500 <laughs> North 10th Street, according 10th Street. to the Google. Okay. Cool. All right. So it's Sunday in East Stroudsburg doing a, a, a plaster sort of demonstration. Monday, the 18th uh, at Wild Fox Farm up in Bartow. You're going to be doing an e Reezy demonstration and then a hemp creek kind of workshop in the city on Tuesday. So sounds like there's something for everybody. And uh, yeah, it's going to be good. You had people from all over the world last year. Like there was a guy from Hawaii. There was people from Texas and, and North Carolina. So yeah, uh, it was a really incredible time last year. We were we were dead after those five days, uh, which is why we uh, shortened it to three days this year. Um, it was a whirlwind, which we ended at Pocono Organics for their uh, Food Forever event. And, um, you know, we were just truly covered in lime. Um, <laughs> And yeah, yeah, cracking as we walked across the, <laughs> the fields there. Um, but it was it was a really wonderful event. We did we had people come from all over the country and uh, made some lasting uh, relationships with people there. Uh, also, you know, Cameron uh, and Amer Shamf are, are working on putting um, a, a package together, which you could maybe just you know yeah. hit on, uh, which is also another really great reason for anybody that's looking to you know build their portfolio and add this uh, service. Uh, construction company wise, um, Cam. Yeah, we uh, the the interesting thing about um, our our Hempcrete Week crew was that Eric and I uh, uh, staffed my booth uh, down at the Southern Hemp Expo a couple weeks ago in Raleigh mm -hmm. um, at, that that we both spoke at Eric. Um, and, oh, yeah, I was there. I saw you. Yeah, that's there. right. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and so it was it was kind of weird, but we had like seven of our 20 Hempcrete Week alumni like at the booth at one point. Right, right. So it was people that were serious and are still serious and are really, you know, engaging and, and getting into it. But uh, yeah, we were we were at the booth uh, with our, our new fabrication partner, um, EZG Manufacturing, which makes that big, sexy orange mixer that I use. Some of your uh, farming uh, followers might have seen and drooled over a bit. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's basically a big mortar mixer that's hydraulic actuated, but that company is going to be our fabrication partner for the Americanized version of the e equipment, which we're going to hopefully release next year. So 
Um, this is a chance for everyone to come see it, get a, get a look at it, you know, partner what they see with what they've seen that we've done this year with it project wise. Uh, and, you know, again, we're, we're going to be opening that, that equipment up, hopefully for, for delivery in late spring, uh, pre-orders taken in, in January or, or somewhere in there. Cool. Uh, and that's but, on uh, your website on Marichon? Not yet. But it will be. Breaking news. Breaking <laughs> oh, news. you heard it here oh, first. No, I'm <laughs> uh, yeah, no, we're we're getting it together. It's uh, you know, there's quite a, 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 a sort of logistical and also liability hill to climb when it comes to you know releasing a piece of equipment, um, mm -hmm. and one especially that can be uh, dangerous. You know, all equipment is, but um it's it's a it's a heavy lift but it's really important and again you know like we mentioned earlier all of these techniques and systems that we're going to be demonstrating and uh you know during hempcrete week are really aimed at encouraging people to try hempcrete and to use it and to get into trying it and that it's not this great barrier to entry um that it can be made democratic and accessible for for everyone so um, that's, that's what we really saw with the Eureasy system to begin with. And we, we've kind of proven that this year and we want to make that, uh, couple that with, you know, an education on how to finish the hemcrete and then also how to do it by hand. If you don't want to go spend the money on equipment yet. I mean, it's a very accessible, um, you know, way to build your home that isn't, uh, toxic for you or for the planet. So we want people to believe that. And, uh, we're also hoping to have Anna from coexist on, uh, Tuesday there. She's an AIA architect. Yep. yep. Out of Landon, PA. Um, been on the show before. They're doing great things down there. And we're hoping to have her come. We haven't confirmed yet, but we're hoping to have her come and speak uh, at the viaduct as well. Um, oh, so cool. definitely if you're a builder, architect, engineer, you know, developer type, um, the, the professional intro to the material will happen uh, at the viaduct on, on oh, that no, Tuesday. Tuesday. Um, and if you're a step further into it, maybe, and you want to, you know, try a finishing technique or come and, you know, hold a, an e easy gun and spray some hempcrete, that's, that's Monday and Tuesday for you. But certainly all three days, uh, lots of value, hoping to have some people stay the whole time um, and create that continuity. And I'm sure we will. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for the, uh, the platform here, Eric. We yeah, sure. As always. I'll put all the links on the show page and uh, we'll encourage people to sign up and, uh, yeah, go learn about hempcrete. Yeah, Boom. I think um, I think one of the, the most important takeaways is over the last year since Hempcrete one and now Hempcrete uh, 2021 um, is that you are now fully capable of getting someone to build you the hemp house of your dreams. And it is not going to take you months or years. It's going to take you weeks and you can go on Cameron's uh, Instagram and check out the work that's being done and get inspired. Uh, we need more than just Cameron out there doing this, though, uh, from, right. an, from an end use perspective. Well, there, just to be fair to the other seven people in the space, there are other people doing this, right? <laughs> um, We're, and we all are friends and we all share and network and support each other and celebrate each other's successes. Uh, at this point, there is so much more to be gained from sharing openly. Yep. And that's what we're trying to do with, with Hempcrete Week. It's not you know, meant to be self-serving. We're trying to keep the costs as low as possible. Um, for the value that we're that we're kind of trying to deliver and again, you know with that eye on democratizing the material and making it not uh, you know an exclusive um, You know thing that that only certain people can afford. I think that we, we desperately need that so yeah. and, we do. and we desperately need more than seven people That's right. there doing this. Yeah, um, and the goal with Cameron and his equipment uh, and this spray applied, you know method uh, is that it's here it's working and uh, we need to show people the way. Cool. I love what you guys are doing. Thank you so much for the work that you are doing. And I look forward to seeing you at least uh, at one of the Hempcrete week days. Yeah, come on your birthday and bring a chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I thought you were getting plastered on Sunday, but you're saying... No, no, no plastered, <laughs> plastered into Eric's birthday RV effigy burning. Like burning that, but Lancaster farming style. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, it's great to talk to you guys, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in person soon. Cheers, brother. Good to see you. Thank Thanks, you. Eric. And just like that, the show was over. Thank you for listening. And again, be sure to check out LancasterFarming.com. Click on those links. Go register for Hempcrete Week. Go check out the video for Buffalo Black. All that stuff. And hey, while you're there, become a member of the National Hemp Association, right? 
Anyway, thank you for listening to today's show. My name is Eric Herlock, and I can always be reached by email. Send it to podcast at lancasterfarming.com or call me up. Leave me a message, 717. What is my number? 721-4462. All right, leave me a message. I'll call you back. Oh, so what else? So here's what I'm thinking, all right? This, this has been on my mind. So I think I'm going to bring this show to a close. Not this episode. I mean the whole Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. Just going to neatly bring it to a close. Or that's what I've been thinking anyway. And then today I see the news that Paul McCartney is growing hemp. So I don't know. Is that a sign from God that I should continue? Here's what I'm thinking bring this this show to a close and then in the new year start like a new season maybe it's a new show but it's about more than just hemp it's about regenerative agriculture it's about entrepreneurship it's about climate change mitigation it's about how farmers are saving the world that's what i want to talk about so do you have thoughts on that hit me up send me an email i would really love to hear your feedback on all of this So anyway, my name is Eric Harlock. I'm the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. Don't take my word for it. Get yourself a subscription. Check us out online. It'll change your life. Anyway, uh, until next time, I'll see you in the newspaper. Industrial Hemp. Episode 161 of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. It's copyright 2021 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written and recorded, edited and produced by Eric Burlock. Any music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadows.